Hey, we have some uh, some in. We uh loading up here. All right, just checking the comments. We give a little bit to uh, maybe some people, last minute people to join. All right, I'm going to dive in. So my name is Jeremiah. Uh, Andrew invited me here to talk to you guys about uh, gluten-free brewing. Um, I gave him a bio so you guys could get to know a little bit about me to kind of recap some of that. I brew, here, uh, brew beer here in Michigan, and uh, I've uh, been doing it for about 10 years now. And I've had a chance to um, consult for a lot of uh, opening breweries, for a lot of pre-existing breweries, and in some of that work, I came across uh, gluten-free brewing, which was uh, something I decided to tackle. And when I first went into it, I was actually very uh, sure of myself, uh, we'll say for a lack of a better term. Uh, at that point, I had been brewing beer a long time and extracting sugar was just sort of something that I felt I'd have no problem with. Well, gluten-free brewing and the gluten-free brewing that we're going to be talking about is actually a lot more difficult than that. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So when I say gluten-free beer, I'm talking about 100% uh, dedicated gluten-free brewing. Right now, we have uh, commercially available to us through, I think, White Labs, the ClearX. A lot of breweries make great examples of what we call gluten-reduced beers. Uh, on the market. Um, there's actually quite a few even around me here in the Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan area, and they're outstanding. I love them. I don't have celiac, so I can drink that stuff and never have to worry. But some people uh, will actually say they have a little bit of uh, an intolerance to it or a sen sensitive, uh, you know, sort of reaction to some of those. So um, they're using ClearX to basically, uh, you know, break down the uh, gluten proteins further and then through proper, um, you know, uh, clarification and flock, flocculation procedures and using your break tanks, um, you should be able to reach a point of less than 20 parts per million of gluten content in, uh, in your beer. Uh, like I said, some people still have sensitivity to that and that product actually cannot receive a gluten-free label. Um, so what I'm talking about is 100% gluten-free brewing, where we're using 100% uh, gluten-free malts, which we'll get into. Uh, it does have the ability to get the gluten-free label. It also, something it shares with uh, its um, gluten-reduced cousin, we'll say, uh, is that it can also pertain less than 20 parts per million of gluten. Now, the other things that a dedicated gluten-free brewery is going to be looking at is that they don't want any cross-contamination. So they're sourcing their grain from, uh, from suppliers that specifically only handle and mill and process gluten-free grains. They're also going to yeast companies um, that will only propagate their yeast on gluten-free ingredients or inert materials that uh, you know the yeast can multiply on but that aren't going to uh, you know add any cross-contamination on the back end uh, so yeah brewing equipment and grain source uh, so there are also in the grain sourcing there are also some uh, grain suppliers that will produce you with millet and buck buckwheat and things like that but they also produce a lot of grains that aren't gluten-free. So that's just a, some people will argue that that's a matter of preference. Um, some will say that it's a necessity. And uh, I personally would say that it's probably a necessity if you're gonna set out with a vision statement for your brewery to be 100% gluten-free uh, to have that. So let's talk a little bit about why gluten-free. Uh, Right now, uh, there's a lot of trends. I mean, I'm, unless you've lived under a rock, you know, you have seen the trend of gluten-free in your supermarkets and uh, in all other places. And even when we go out to our local favorite watering holes and places to eat, uh, you know, that's, that's a thing that we have in our society right now and for good reason. Um, another thing I like to say, though, is that you can't really be gluten-free and be poor. It's kind of a tough thing. You have to 
you know, pick one way. It's hard for, you know, someone in a, a you know, below average uh, income level to carry a gluten-free lifestyle. So that also lends into another reason of why you should maybe consider gluten-free brewing is because there is a market gap there for people in a certain uh, monetary range, we'll say, uh, who miss, you know, miss beer in their everyday life. Maybe they're celiacs or, you know, whatever else. Um, right now, the other reason is uh, we have very few gluten for dedicated gluten-free breweries in the country, at least here in the U.S. Uh, so, you know, we have ones that you may have heard of, like Ghost Fish out of Seattle. They're great. Uh, Groundbreaker out of Portland. They do a great job. Uh, Holiday out of uh, Golden, Colorado. I'd really like to try some of their stuff. So if uh, any of you guys are watching, you know where to find me. Uh, there's also Burning Brothers in St. Paul's and Orox in uh, Emsworth, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. So those are some of the more, I guess, top range right now, seeing as that it's kind of young, uh, uh, available to us on the commercial market. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, being celiacs or having a gluten intolerance. There's, um, you know, by whatever, uh, you know, means you feel like we've gotten to this point as a species where there's more gluten intolerance than we've ever had before, it is a thing. So... With that being said, uh, there is definitely a need for it. And one of the biggest things I've experienced when talking to people who are celiac or, um, you know, gluten intolerant is that they miss beer. I mean, I just imagine us as professionals who do this. And I even know some professionals in my industry uh, who have opened up breweries and later found out that they are celiac. And that in itself has to be really difficult. Uh, so holiday is amazing. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm glad to know that you should tell them to uh, get a hold of Jeremiah. Anyway, so um, there is this opportunity in the market. People who are celiac or gluten-free, they, they do miss this as a part of their everyday life. Hey, buddy. You heading to mom? We're broadcasting from home today. Hope everyone else has their OJ ready. All right. So anyway, uh, on to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my first three gluten-free beers that I brewed. So as I said before, I kind of went into this confidently and I definitely learned something. The first beer I set out to produce, I did not want to use any sorghum. Uh, sorghum is uh, right now, Redbridge is probably the most um, popular gluten-free beer that you are readily available. I don't know about popular uh, readily available gluten-free beer you can find on the market. And it is pretty much 100% sorghum based. Um, sorghum also has this way of leaving behind an astringency and um, some sort of undesirable flavors. And so I set out to make uh, what was supposed to be a grapefruit wit. Now, you know, wit and gluten-free, two words that are not synonymous. And uh, it was a, a pretty big... Uh, challenge. So my malt bill had some things in it to kind of lend the same sort of properties, at least what I was hoping for, um, into the wit. Now I ran into the first few set of problems I had was with milling because I got all of my grains uh, whole uh, from my supplier. And so I milled them myself and the buckwheat in particular gave a really big challenge to, to put through the mill. So um, not only at that point where my um, some other things that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, my enzyme use and my milling were, uh, were off, but, um, you know, had several other issues that just resulted in poor uh, extraction, poor starch conversion, and it ended up basically turning into a hopped grapefruit seltzer. Uh, some people said they liked it. I hated it thought it was terrible and it was worse than the very first homebrew batch of beer I tried to ever make so it's one of those you know defeats uh, and so I tried to take some things that I learned from that thinking okay I'm having a, tr uh, a problem milling these grains and getting this extraction so maybe I need to rely a little heavily or heavier on uh, sorghum maybe I need to introduce a sorghum you know base uh, uh, sugar so I ended up trying a New England IPA and I brewed it the way I brewed 
every other New England IPA I've ever brewed. And uh, it ended up being a muddy sorghum IPA mess. And it was not very good. Super hazy, way too hazy. And uh, also, again, just poor um, sugar extraction. Around this time, the science was kind of coming out about uh, enzyme use and how to properly do that. I also spoke um, with a brewer out west who gave me some insights. Thankfully, we're in a, you know, a community of brewers who can do things like this and help each other. I chatted with him and he turned me on to some things that we'll talk about. And uh, that made the biggest difference. So I went back then and made this amazing lavender amber ale uh, with no sorghum. I used honey instead. I wanted to avoid that sorghum flavor that ended up in the IPA. It was, uh, the IPA was muddy, but mostly I didn't like it because of the sorghum profile. Uh, the third one, the amber turned out great, used honey to kind of boost uh, the sugars a little bit. And it also changed um, my mash procedure. So the first two brews, I had been doing a cereal mash because when you kind of do some basic research as a home brewer, at least in this young form of brewing, uh, that's what you're kind of going to find is uh, decoction and uh, uh, cereal mashes. Well, that didn't work well for me. I talked with someone who said, go with your regular single, single infusion mash and learn your enzymes, learn how to use them. It makes all the difference in your starch conversion. So we'll get into that. But uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about ingredients. Um, you know, as I said before, these are 100% gluten-free ingredients that need to be milled in a facility that does not process anything with gluten in it. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is millet. I have an example here. It might be a little hard to see, but it is bird seed. It's really small. It's kind of difficult to mill. You have to really have a tight tolerance to uh, to get where you want to want to go with that. But uh, it's roasted, you know, uh, to whatever sort of specification, the same way you would do with a, a standard two row or, or whatever else. Um, so this is, I think, their basic. Oops, sorry. This is their basic uh, pale um, millet from Grouse, um, who is one of the main suppliers I use, one of two. Um, and then we have buckwheat. Now this is the bane of my existence. And these are both what I'm showing you examples of uh, what they look like whole kernel. I'll take one of them out of here to kind of show it off to the camera. Let's see, maybe if I do this. No, no, I see YouTubers do this sometime and it helps. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of an oblong, very, like, it's like an armored shell. And you would think, you look at this and you go, well, Jeremiah, are you trying to brew a stout? And I crack this thing open, if I can. Maybe we have one already cracked open in there, because these things are tough. Here we go. We're kind of peeling off the shell here. So underneath this black husk, for those who aren't familiar with buckwheat, you have this, you know, standard sort of white grain. Let's see, bring it this way. Yeah, so you get the idea. And then the other one, this is milled, but this is blue corn. Love this stuff. I haven't actually seen it impart any color yet, but I'm hopeful for the day because it's so pretty. Look at it, it's purple. It's got some like blue, I don't know, they call it blue corn, but it's more purple to me, um, smelled up here. And so there's a couple of examples. Uh, then also we can use rice sorghum, as I mentioned. Um, I got my sorghum, uh, and I would only recommend this, I got mine white sorghum from Brees, uh, came in a five gallon pail, kind of expensive, but uh, you know, it works uh, as a sugar source. And then corn, as I mentioned, then we also have oats, uh, you know, your typical rolled oats, though, again, like we said, processed through a facility you trust if you're dedicated to this. Uh, honey, and then uh, a lot of breweries or a couple of breweries in the commercial market are using, um, you know, uh, nut shells, like chestnut shells, walnut shells, things like that, kind of provide some of that, uh, those characters you're looking for. Um, because we'll, as we'll get into, and as I've mentioned before, this is young, so there's not a whole lot of tasting notes or things like that to kind of lead you in a way when you're formulating a recipe to get the desired outcome. So some people got very creative and decided that if they're chasing certain flavors, they could use uh, walnut and chestnut shells. Kind of cool. 
Uh, so my two sources that I use uh, when I'm getting these, and these are um, these are sources that you need to have commercial accounts um, to get. Uh, the two that I like the most are grouse. Um, I get all my millet, uh, buckwheat, corn, oats, and my enzymes from them, which we'll talk about which ones in a bit. And then Eckert malting. Um, and Eckert malting has a range of rice. Like the guy only does rice. He's got one called uh, um, James Brown, James Brown rice. His name's Jim. So it's his James Brown rice. And uh, wow, what this guy does with rice is incredible. It'll blow your mind. He he even brews with this stuff. He's got a little brewery associated with his uh, operation and they do 100% uh, rice beers and they are great. He does a great job and I definitely recommend uh, buying from him. Even if you're looking for rice and uh, non-gluten-free brewing, I would definitely check out Eckert. Uh, anyway, so one of the things that you encounter when you're, even after you find a supplier to get these grains, as we kind of lightly touched on, is you have nothing for your uh, um, SRM. You have no way of determining what your beer color might be. There's um, software and many things available to the home brewer and the commercial brewer uh, in a standard brewing practice to kind of have an idea or a sense when they're formulating their recipe about what they're going to have in the end. Basically, none of that exists right now. It's still young. I won't say it doesn't exist. It's being developed. Uh, so knowing how much fermentable sugar is there, it more becomes a case of your enzyme practices than anything. So even if they were to give you a, a, a number of what would be available uh, sugar content, it might not help that much if you don't have good enzyme use. Uh, so general lack of science and tasting notes and it being a young science has made it kind of difficult to uh, formulate uh, recipes. So that's something that's going to continue to evolve and grow. And uh, I see sort of in the next two to five years that really uh, being an issue of the past. Uh, right now we have uh, enzymes and starch conversion. So here's, here's where the big uh, bulk of your problem is going to be. And really, I kind of have the, the belief that if you can get it into the boil kettle and you've done literally everything you can to extract all the sugar and use your enzymes correctly, that the rest of it is a cakewalk if you have decent practices. Uh, but the mash procedure and the enzyme use is the most crucial part of gluten-free brewing. Uh, so we use two different, or I use two different enzymes. I'll use a heat stable alpha amylase, which uh, converts my starches to dextrin. And it's derived from a bacillus. Don't ask me to say the second word. It's a bacillus. Uh, I'm not even going to try, but it's, it, they, they put this, um, uh, bacillus in a deep fermentation and they extract the enzy enzymes from that fermentation. And that is used to convert your starches uh, more easily into dextrin. Um, and then uh, glucoamylase, uh, which is your starch um, and short chain dextrin to glucose conversion. Um, those two, it's the best way to, to describe it with what I use as a, single, as a single infusion mash is almost like a bell curve. Your temperature and time um, definitely dictate your enzyme use, um, how well you're going to convert these starches and therefore how much sugar, available sugar for fermentation you're gonna have. Um, mashing procedures then, so like I said, I started with cereal mash. Uh, I see other people using decoction mashes. Um, after I tried, uh, before I, I talked with someone and they said, Jeremiah, just go with your single infusion mash and do what you do best. You know how to extract sugar. So do it and use your enzymes correctly. Um, what I was seeing with some of these cereal and decoction mashes with these particular ingredients, and if you do some basic research, you'll find people mashing and uh, um, resting at about 190 degrees. Now, if you're anything like me, when you see that thing go even close to 160, you're starting to scream at the kettle. Uh, I can't imagine. And that's why I had such poor 
uh, conversion in the beginning because I wasn't using enzymes and I wasn't heating up that high. But then again, going back to the lack of science, there's nothing to tell you what astringencies you're going to pull and at what temperature range you're going to pull them, like we have with all of our other ingredients used in traditional brewing. So it was one of those things I just couldn't bring myself to heat a mash to 190 plus degrees. I mean, some people swear by boiling it. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, I've heard of situations with people who will uh, do rice conversions for like eight or nine hours or 12 hours or something, because they say that is the, uh, at a lower temperature, because they say that that is the uh, proper time that it takes for these starches to convert more naturally. Well, if you don't want to wait nine hours, 10 hours to uh, convert, um, you're going to want to look into some enzymes. Uh, so we do a single infusion mash. I never go above 158. And uh, basically, I use it as a sliding scale. Since I'm not heating my mash so hot to uh, make that conversion, I add a little bit more. It doesn't require much, but a little bit more than the recommended um, amount of enzymes, uh, specifically the heat stable alpha to, to my mash and give it proper rest and um, you shouldn't have any trouble. Now, you'll probably be messaging me at some point with some questions uh, asking uh, and saying Jeremiah had trouble anyway. And I'm, I assure you that those things can be addressed and fixed. Um, but this is the most uh, important part of it. So your mash versus your enzymes and um, your final result should be uh, something drinkable, something uh, that you'd like, um, which was what I set, to, set out to do, not being celiac. I really couldn't live with brewing a product that I myself didn't enjoy as well. Um, and when we're making something that people are going to put into their bodies, I feel like you owe it to yourself to, you know, due diligence to, uh, to do it right. And uh, so right now, after you, you know, you tackle those challenges and you get to this point in your brewing practices for gluten-free, you're going to then notice the biggest, single most um, sort of, I don't know how to explain it, but basically the, the thing you're going to see most in gluten-free beers is the lack of body. Um, every single gluten-free beer I've brewed and I've tried, uh, there's very little ability to adjust the body. Typically, these are things we do in traditional brewing via temperature. And I don't know if it's, again, science is young, but I don't know if it's the enzymes, um, you know, taking over more that doesn't allow it to gain that body or what, but that is uh, going to be the future challenge, um, in my opinion, for gluten-free brewing is still capturing that mouthfeel uh, and things you want in a, in a gluten-free beer uh, or in a, in a regular beer for that matter. Um, so when I first started brewing these and all of them were very light bodied and thin, that was what I beat myself up most about um, alongside of the sugar, I suppose, but uh, was just the lack of mouthfeel and the lack of, um, you know, the lack of a uh, uh, of body to it. And I had to realize at the end of the day that, a lot of people who are gluten free, they're not, um, they're not necessarily looking for that. They just want good beer. But I still find it myself that the challenge is to make well bodied, um, clean, well made beer. And uh, so that's all I have uh, to share. I guess we're going to roll over to some um, questions to see if anybody has anything to ask me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll uh, Thanks for letting me come and share with you guys. I'm over in the comments section now, so if anybody has uh, anything they'd like to ask, go ahead. Okay, here we go. So we got some questions coming in. I can't see exactly who it is, but uh, 
someone asked, would using lactose help with the mouthfeel? Um, this is something I've tried on stout. So uh, Eckert Malting has a, 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 a rice called gas hog. And that stuff is motor oil when you malt it. And uh, in, con uh, in conjuncture with some lactose, you can definitely help that. But you're still going to find um, it's a little thinner than you like. If you're as picky as me, it might, it might adjust it to a point where you're like, yeah, this is great. What's Jeremiah talking about? But really, those are the only two ways I've found to get a uh, decent body. I have heard of other people using things like inulin, which is like a digestive support supplement um, that can uh, thicken uh, um, liquids. Uh, I want to do some more research into that before I just go ahead and start putting it in beer, though. So that's where I'm at with that. Uh, all right. So we got, uh, we got someone asking, oh, they say they missed the start. What grains are we using? All right, well, let's go back real quick. No problem. Uh, we are using millet, buckwheat, rice, sorghum, corn, oats. Uh, well, honey is not a grain, but we're using honey for sugar. And uh, walnuts and chestnut shells for flavoring. Um, this isn't a particular grain bill. These are just examples of uh, gluten-free ingredients to help provide the same um, realm of flavor as we have in traditional brewing. Anybody else, any other questions for me? Also feel free to, to message me or reach out to Andrew for my, my contact info. Um, I'm always happy to help. And uh, you know, one thing I wanted to say is that right now we're kind of in this um, age of uh, of uh, what I like to call, um, it's, it's a, like information is very linear where you can jump on your phone and you can Google pretty much anything you wanna know about, right? Well, one thing as a brewer and as things are going, um, I like to, I found that being as close to the source of that knowledge um, is, you know, is the best and that's where I like to be. So this kind of invigorated me as a brewer to, um, get back into fermentation science and look at it from a way um, that I haven't seen. And I tell you what, learning how to brew gluten-free beer has actually helped me brew better traditional beer as well. Uh, let's see. Have any good sources for enzyme usage recommendations? Um, I would, if you're going to source from Grouse, I would, they give you uh, recommended and I kind of just go above recommended, which was something I was kind of nudged in the ribs and told by another brewer to just use a little bit more than what they recommend, and I should have much better results. So um, that information is typically available um, through Grouse, um, and that's what I got there. I don't have it right here in front of me, but uh, if you message me, I can get that information together for you. So Amy's asking, in my experience, what styles are people looking for in the gluten-free market? Well, I mean, that's a very, that's a good question. I think you're pretty safe with, you know, things like IPAs. You know, any any guy who wants to mow his lawn and uh, who, who happens to be celiac and wants to enjoy a good beer and is excited about craft beer and isn't content with Redbridge, he's probably going to want a nice IPA. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of, um, you know, I, when I enter and start brewing at uh, new breweries, one of the biggest questions I get is, well, what are you going to brew first? And I like to look at uh, what the people around me are drinking. So I really feel like that's one of those relative questions where, uh, you know, people are going to uh, miss certain types of beer depending on where they're at. It could be regional. It, you know, there's many factors that could go into that. But I don't think you'd ever go wrong with your mainstays, you know, a blonde or a, a Kolsch style or a... Uh, some sort of wheat style. I wish you better luck than I had on my first uh, wit, uh, um, gluten-free wit beer. But uh, yeah, some of those I'd, I'd say would be a good place to start. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. Again, get my info if you need any help. I'm uh, always available and uh, to those who are um, looking to, to start a business or, or go into this field feel free to reach out to me and uh, oh, here we go. We got one more question. All right, we're going to do one last one. Currently using mini brew COVID solutions. No, there's a restriction on max mashing temp. What is the lowest I can 
to go to get near the top of the bell curve on extraction. I'd say your standard infusion temp, like 154, 156, obviously you're going to strike in a little hotter to account for if you're uh, all grain, you're going to account for some of these things. But I like to come in 154, 156, highest I'll go is 158. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that specific system, so I don't know if that is capable with that, but I would say your standard uh, beer temp range with good enzyme use um, is, is going to get you there. So awesome. Thanks guys. I really appreciate everything and, uh, uh, appreciate you guys having me here to, uh, to do this and, uh, I hope to do one of these again in the future on another topic. Cheers.